faith, but struggling relationally. Every good thing is born of a struggle, sing, and every good thing is born of a struggle. Every truly good thing is born of a struggle, my child. Every good thing is born of a struggle, sing, and every good thing is born of a struggle. Every truly good thing is born of a struggle, my child, my child. And I wouldn't leave you in this heartache if it was all for nothing. Wouldn't leave you in this struggle if I didn't see something being born in you. So beautiful and so true, like a statue of David chiseled away and never faint. There's a new child rising, new life shining in your face, in your pain, in your everything. Child, what I see in you, child, I think you want it too. But I'm proud of you, child, as you struggle through. Yes, I'm proud of you, child, as you struggle through. Yeah, just remember every good thing is born of a struggle. Singing every good thing is born of a struggle. Every truly good thing is born of a struggle, my child. Sing with me now. I had such a hard time teaching that guy those moves, it, it took hours. <laughs> hours hours <laughs> uh, it, he's the coolest monk alive I don't know many monks but I can dare say he's the coolest monk alive this series is called struggling uh, for the past 18 months when I've interacted with people one of the common things that I heard again and again probably you've said it too man this COVID thing and all that it's brought and all the economic pressure and the relational pressure and so forth it's just got me struggling Randy I am struggling I'm just kind of like hanging on by a thread and I wanted to do this series because what I want to try to convince you, because it was convinced to me by God, is that struggling is a good thing. It's like the song says, it's not such a bad thing. As long as you and I think that struggling is a bad thing, it's going to feel bad, we're going to feel bad, we're going to be to some degree incapacitated, we're not going to derive the benefit, yeah I did say it, the benefit that God wants us to have from struggling now the topic today is struggling relationally and and I don't know I mean a crowd like this it, I'm not even going to do this message today unless there's at least more than two people that would like to hear some help with relational struggle is there at least more than two can I see just see your hands oh good <laughs> okay I'll do the message then I was just going to whip something up no I'm not spontaneous at all you know that you that have been around for a while know that relational struggle now I have to start by saying this that nothing that I'm going to say from here forward is going to make an awful lot of sense to you unless you have a clear God-given purpose for your life and most of the people that I've met through the years now folks that are used to being around me for decades know that I emphasize this a lot but most of the people that I've met get a room full of 100 people and you ask them say what's the purpose for your life and you'll hear a hundred different things or an awful lot of silence but the scripture the bible the revelation that the creator of the universe has given of himself of life he tells us exactly in his word what is your purpose if you've ever had any uncertainty about your purpose in life here it is you are here i am here to become the Christ-like version of myself, of yourself, that you were always meant to be, and to do the Christ-like set of deeds that you alone can do. You have a different capacity than I have, so I'm here to be the person that Christ meant me to be and to do what Christ meant me to do. That is the purpose of every human life. Let me go further. What does that look like, Randy? I'm just going to assume you're thinking, what does that look like? It's learning to live the way that God himself lives and learning to love the way that God himself loves. Now, it, it all starts, of course, with my, your, our willingness to put our trust in our creator, Christ. The scripture says that God's done everything that he can to reveal himself as loving and for us and good and kind and unselfish to the point that Christ took on humanity. The creator of the universe took on human form to let us see we can trust him that he's for us that he loves us he allowed human beings to nail him to a cross to demonstrate his sacrificial love even for the people that were driving the nails through his hand you might recall maybe you've heard it somewhere he said from the cross father forgive them they don't know what they're doing so as we sit here today here's one of the things you need to know 
the God who created you, who has been with you every second of your life, though maybe like me, maybe you never gave him a lot of thought until age 23, I gave him next to no thought, kind of used his name as a curse word and that sort of thing. And yet the scripture revealed to me that that God was always with me, always loved me, was always for me, was always seeking to get my attention, that he saw every tear, every fear, every dream, every struggle, and so it is with you. If you sit here today know that you are eternally loved by this creator and he waits he waits to draw you to himself until you and i yeah amen feel safe safe enough to draw close to him so when people don't know their god-given purpose for life which is to learn to live like god lives and love like god loves to become who you were meant to be and do what you were meant to do when people don't have that purpose here's what we tend to do as a default purpose we think like this man, I don't know how long I'm going to live. I'm only going to be here for a little while, so I'm going to try to stretch it out. I'm going to try to live as long as I can, number one. Number two, I'm going to try to have as much pleasure, as much fun, as much joy as I can. So this is our default purpose in life if we don't know our God-given purpose. Now, everything that I'm going to say to you in this message, unless you embrace your God-given purpose, it's not going to be very helpful, so I'm just telling you that up front. If you're just living to kind of stretch out your journey as long as you can and get all the pleasure you can because you're thinking death is the end of everything and you don't know what happens after that, well, then the rest of this isn't going to make sense because it's about looking at this life as a developmental journey with the certainty that the Christ who died on the cross rose from the grave and promised all who put their trust in him and become his followers will also receive eternal life in the world that we've always wanted. Inside of every human being, there's this longing for a perfect existence, a perfect world. We're going to see this in a second, perfect relationships. That perfect world, those perfect relationships, that perfectly healthy body that we all on some level want, well, it can only occur when Christ gives us, through his power, that kind of a life, and he promises to do that for those once again who make a decision so if you're sitting here today pause just pause for a minute and think with me maybe you've wondered at some point what is a christian what what does it even mean to be a christian i mean i i go to church well i could live in a dog house it wouldn't make me a dog right right so just going to church doesn't make you a christian what is a christian a christian is an individual that has come to see that christ their creator is worthy of their trust and so they choose to put their faith their trust in christ and become his follower if i'm not following him i don't trust him say Randy, what do you mean follow him well follow him it means like this it means i go to his word now because i trust him more than i trust myself i want to know the way he designed me i want to know from him the way life was meant to be i go to his word and if i find in his word he says learn how to do this develop this particular trait cultivate this well i start doing it because i trust him if i go look in his word and he says stop doing this well i stop doing it because i know it must be bad for me whether i understand it or not that's what it means to follow christ so a christian is one who makes a decision you could make that decision before you leave here today puts their trust in christ and becomes his follower and he promises that anybody that becomes his follower he not only forgives us all of our sins but he guarantees us the gift of everlasting life in that kingdom in that world in that life we've always wanted and it lasts forever okay so that that's just kind of getting us started so here's the thing about struggling relationally some of us some of us have spent a great deal of our life uh, struggling to run from relational struggles so that's kind of where we want to get started running away from relational struggles so why do we do this why why do we try to avoid relational struggles why are they so uncomfortable let's look First of all, something I'm calling spiritual revulsion. You say, what the heck is spiritual revulsion? Well, I'm going to read you a verse, and I hope it will clarify what I mean by it. This is from the Old Testament, Proverbs 19.22. It says, everyone longs for a love that what? Notice it says everyone. Everyone has something inside of us. We long for love that never fails. Let, let me expand on that a bit. It's saying that every human being that's ever existed longs for 
great relationships with everyone they ever meet with the stranger with the friend with the relative with the spouse with the children everyone that's ever lived longs for love that will never fail we never get enough of good relationships why what what drives that well the scripture says that God the creator made us in his own image and he himself is a love driven being and so we are made to love and love necessitates relationship and so we crave on the inside to get along with everybody all the time and so the reason that we run from spiritual struggles is they they just feel so terrible they feel so bad we want wonderful relationships with everybody we, is there anybody here that you just go out of your way to to not get along with people can i see your hand <laughs> okay no even when it doesn't look like we're trying we kind of are at least so we run away from relational struggles because they just feel so bad we want perfect relationships with everybody all the time we want to be liked we want to be loved we want to be admired we want to be accepted all the time by everyone everywhere and yet we know that that's hard to come by so we run away from relational struggles because they're painful let me go on the second reason we run away from relational struggles is something I'm calling seasoned recognition seasoned recognition I mean we're experienced and because we're experienced in life we start to recognize certain things and one of the things we know is that relational struggles they they hurt like I said and we know that certain people in certain situations certain attitudes bring that hurt more frequently so let me look at some scripture or share some scripture with you Proverbs 20 again the Old Testament it says it's to one's honor to what avoid avoid strife or conflict relational struggle but every fool is quick to quarrel so we start learning how most of us to avoid relational struggles because it feels so lousy now some of us we become such masters at this and some of you got to hear this because this might be the whole message for you today some of us become such masters at avoiding struggle that we are ghosts we don't really exist nobody knows who we are nobody gets the real version of ourselves because the real version of ourselves is hidden away because we don't want to be hurt now the problem with this is that we're slowly losing our souls we're losing ourselves we're, we're losing our god-given identity and humanity we're, we're disintegrating as people instead of developing as people and so we run away from the struggles because of the pain but in the in the process sometimes we're, we're losing we're losing ourselves we're becoming so inauthentic as, as to be non-existent but we try to avoid strife here's another reason why it says starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam so drop the matter before a dispute breaks out we're we're seasoned we're experienced we learn that sometimes it's just better to drop something how many of you know sometimes it's just better to drop something right it's, there's certain things that are just not worth the struggle but we have to be careful because that can become a lifelong pattern where we're always running away from things and sometimes we shouldn't drop the matter sometimes we have to work through the matter and that's not easy that's a struggle here's another reason proverbs 26 21 it says like charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire so is a what kind of a person contentious, contentious person to kindle strife or struggle we start learning in life that there are certain personality types and there are certain personality types that are contentious argumentative just curious do, do you maybe know one of those people does anybody here know a contentious argumentative person if you're sitting beside one just wink <laughs> I, I can see it but they can't <laughs> no we know man there's just contrarian people they're just contentious and argumentative and we we learn to spot these people in life and so we're running away from struggle we become astute at recognizing these kind of characters and we avoid them here's another re reason it says an angry person stirs up conflict relational struggle we start getting where oh that's one of those angry women man stay away from her <laughs> or that's one of those angry dudes man no, no, don't go around him we start learning and so we're running away from types of people they're still people 
There might be very confused people, but there's still people. But we're running away because we're struggling, but we're, we're struggling to run away from relational struggle. You can't get away from the struggle. You're just struggling in a different way. We also notice that there's certain attitude types that we want to avoid because they tend toward relational struggle. Here's a couple. Proverbs 10 says, Hatred stirs up conflict or relational struggle. We know that when we hear someone talk and they're, they're just fuming with hatred and there are people like this, they'll tell you, man, quick, I hate this and I hate that and I hate this person and I hate that person. But when we hear this, we're like, oh boy, that's somebody I'm going to start backing off from because that's, that's likely to be somebody that's going to have lots of relational struggle around them. So we've run away from them. Second kind of a person that cur- stirs up a lot of relational struggle Pride or attitude, pride leads to conflict or relational struggle. When people are proud, they always think they're right. And they have an opinion about everything, and they think everyone needs to know their opinion about everything. And so they, they tend to be argumentative. Now, now, the thing about proud people, what I've seen through the years, is that look at it like a coin. Now, on one side is the proud version of the person that we get on the other side of the coin is a, is a very scared, insecure person who's trying to prove to themselves that they have some worth and substance. Often that is the case of the proud person. Nevertheless, nevertheless, when we see it, we know that they tend to be the type that you're going to get into some kind of relational struggle, so we struggle to run away from them. So some of us, <laughs> we're still struggling, but we're struggling to run away from struggle. We're trying to build a life that avoids struggle and people that cause struggle. So let me, let me give you some conclusions real quick. First of all, we run away from struggle because it's painful. We can't exactly explain it why, but everything can be going good in our lives. Every area of our lives can be going good, but if there's a relationship in which we're struggling with someone, it tends to just poison everything. It just gets to us. It bothers us. It eats at us. We, we can't get past it. So it's painful so we run away we don't like relational struggle but here's the thing we know it's unavoidable there's only been a short period in history where relational struggle was avoidable there's only been two people in all of human history that knew what it was not to have any relational struggle at all anybody want to give a gander who they are Adam and Eve (laughs) yeah if you read Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 Adam and Eve the first two humans they had no relational struggle. They had a perfect relationship with God, a perfect relationship with their environment, perfect relationship with one another. Eve was a little suspicious. She would count Adam's ribs when he went to sleep at night. But, <laughs> but other than that, it was, it was a great life together. <laughs> Some of you, you know, you're going to have to think on that one a little bit. Uh, read Genesis 2. You'll, you'll know what, what it's about. But they experienced what we all want, perfect relationships with God, with each other, perfect peace with themselves. But as soon as they broke trust with God in Genesis chapter 3, well, they no longer had peace with God, they no longer had peace with each other, and they no longer had peace within themselves. And so no one has known a a life of relationships without struggle since then. Now, Christ promises, like I said at the beginning of the message, that when he returns and establishes his kingdom, those that in this life have made a decision to trust him and be his followers, we will inherit an everlasting kingdom. Listen, folks, this life is not long enough for any of us. You can't get it all in this life, and even if you get it all, you won't have it long enough to enjoy it, and somebody will try to steal it from you. If eternal life is not a reality, then we are the saddest of all creatures. But Christ rose from the dead to prove to us, to give us substance, to know that, yes, as he rose, he promised to raise those who are his followers as well. Unless we have that kind of a certainty, we're going to really avoid relational struggles. But there is a time coming where they will be avoidable. In fact, they won't even be possible in the new world to come that Jesus says goes on forever and ever ever. But for now, even though they're painful, they're not avoidable. Now I want to take you to somewhere that's uncomfortable, the next word. They're normal. Relational struggles are normal. Now on one hand, we say yes. I know that. I know that ever since Genesis chapter 3, they're now normal. 
But something in us says, nah, nah, it should be easier. It shouldn't be this hard. There's something wrong. I, I, I still want to struggle to get away from relational struggles. They're, they're, but I want to suggest to you that for you and I to develop instead of have relational struggles diminish us destroy us relational struggles can destroy us can diminish our capacities but they can also i'm going to show you in the second part of the message they can develop us in order for them to develop us we've got to start here okay normal now i'm going to turn the corner and say instead of running away from relational struggles what if we ran toward them which is counterintuitive we run away from pain. We run away from danger. But what if the way to develop instead of being diminished or destroyed by relational struggles, what if the only way, the way, is to run toward the pain, toward the relational struggles? Because that's exactly what Scripture teaches. The, the God who loves us and made us in his own image, who wants this life to be a developmental journey where we become more and more like Christ, he says, you need, I need, we need to run toward our relational struggles. So let's go there. Running toward relational struggles. Let me go to the next one. Here's where we got to start because our society tells us just the opposite. Struggle is not a sign of relational failure. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, there's someone in this room, and probably a few or a lot, who this thought has gone through your mind or is going through your mind. Because you are struggling in some relational area, you are thinking to yourself, this is just not working. This, this, this is a failed relationship. This is, this is not the way it should be. It shouldn't be this hard. This thing is doomed. This thing needs to be cast away, or I need to run away from it or get out of it. It's just not going to be. We think, we think because society has kind of primed us to think this way, that relational struggle is a sign of failure. It is not. You've got to get this. This might be the whole message. That struggle is normal in this life. How many of you ever had the experience of uh, being around someone that they neither speak English nor do you speak their language? Ever had that experience? Well, it can be difficult, to say the least. Imagine if you were marooned on an island for a year with this person, okay? A year, just you and them, and you can't understand a word each other's saying. How many of you here think you, you, might, you might have some difficulties, you might have some struggles, you might get frustrated with each other? How many think that would be likely? Yeah, but sooner or later you'd learn... The only way I'm going to be able to stand this person and stand relating to this person is I have to learn how to, what's the word, understand them. You see, it's hard to understand one another. First of all, we're always in motion. We don't even understand ourselves most of the time. And we're not the same person from year to year. Who you and I are now, we won't be that same person five years now. We're always in motion. We're always changing. So understanding someone is hard work. It's a struggle. And we have a harder time standing someone or one another until we understand one another. To the degree that we understand one another, we find it at least a tad, a little bit easier to stand one another. So part of what we can do is we can kind of create what I'm going to call some, some relational atmospherics where our struggle is toward reconciliation as opposed to struggling toward getting away from the, the uncomfortable interactions. Reconciling struggles is what God in his word pushes us toward. He says, yes, you're going to struggle relationally, but that's okay. That's a good thing. Struggle is a good thing struggle toward understanding each other struggle toward relating struggle toward finding the language of one another's heart and soul and history and and you might find that you can build a bond that's surprisingly sturdy and worth the effort so let me share some scriptures with you we're going to create some atmospheric some some relational uh, atmospherics that will allow for reconciliatory uh, activity in the New Testament book of Ephesians 4.32, it says it's going to give us three B's, three things to be. God doesn't tell us to be something unless we can be it. 
It says, first of all, be what? Kind. And be what? Compassionate with one another. And be... Oh, man. Shoot. I don't like that one. (laughs) You hurt me. You wound me. You insult me. It's hard for me to forgive you. How about you? Anybody have trouble with that? You have trouble when you're hurt, wounded, cheated, insulted, made fun of, mocked. You have trouble forgiving somebody. Can I see your hands if you have a little trouble with it? Yeah. On the other hand, on the other hand, how many of you are like me? You have, you have this problem that, that I think at least, at least once or more a day, God probably has to forgive me. How, how, how many have that problem? Do you have that problem too? Now, I don't usually think it's a big deal for God to forgive me. I'm not sure why I don't think it's a big deal, but I don't. But for me to forgive you, you, you wound me, you hurt me, you, well, that's hard. Wouldn't it be hard if I wounded you, hurt you? Yeah. But I expect God to forgive me quickly, immediately, lots and lots and lots of times over. But God says we can do this. God says, I can, I can be kind. I can, I can learn to be kind. And if I'm kind, I create some atmospherics that take a relationship that is struggling and I move them toward reconciliation. I'm, I'm creating a context where maybe they can start moving toward one another. If I'm kind, if I'm compassionate, I'm thinking about the other person, I'm getting in their skin, I'm, I'm putting the best construction on what they say. And then if I'm forgiving, man, you can't have relationships in this world unless you're forgiving. I joked earlier about how hard it is to forgive. The truth of the matter is, I forgive pretty darn easy because I know I need a lot of forgiveness myself. Forgiveness is, is a powerful... Now you say, Randy... Are you saying that I'm supposed to forgive that adulterating bum I'm married to? <laughs> or bum is? <laughs> I don't know if that's a word. I just made it up. <laughs> no. We're, I mean, when you're, I'm, I'm talking about general friendships, relationships, you know, and, and general life. When you're talking about adultery, the Scripture speaks very specifically about that. What, 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 what about, you know, physical abuse, Randy? Am I supposed to just forgive that and just let this person continue to abuse me physically? No. Well, what about criminal activity? You know, they, they're asking me to do all this criminal stuff and bringing all this lawless stuff. No, no, no. Look, for things like that, I'm begging you, come to me, come to somebody on your staff, go to a professional counselor, get some counsel. You need some wisdom in that, some mature guidance. Those are, those are special cases. But the average everyday stuff, forgiveness, large, regular doses of forgiveness are both possible and necessary if we're going to try to reconcile, struggle toward reconciling. So it says, be kind, be compassionate, be forgiving each other, just as Christ, or just as in Christ, God forgave you. Now let me show you three other things. Three things to get rid of, and then three things that we have to say no more, no more. Again, we're creating relational, in a relational atmosphere. Get rid of all, what's the first one? Bitterness. Bitterness. How many of you in here are bitter about something? I'm just kidding you. I don't want to know. <laughs> I bet you somebody knows, though. If you're bitter, somebody knows. You, you can be sure of that. Get rid of all bitterness, passion. That's just that, you know, that edgy person, you know, ready to explode all the time. And anger. That's three things we, we need to get rid of if we're going to create an atmosphere that allows relational reconciliation. We're struggling to get closer instead of avoiding and running. Get rid of it. You, God, our loving God who knows this is saying, get rid of your bitterness, Randy. Get rid of the passion. Get rid of the anger. Then he goes and says, no more of this stuff either. No more, what's this one? No more. No more. Can you imagine how dramatically some relationships would improve and how speedily if we, if we took these serious, I'm not going to ask you <laughs> if you're bitter or angry or if you shout or you insult people or have hateful feelings. But I know we, most of us struggle with this stuff at some point or another. It's just part of being human. 
But our God who loves us and knows us says, you don't have to, you don't have to keep these patterns. And if you'll be willing to own them and get rid of them, God, who loves us and knows us, will help us, and they will, they will take these relational struggles, and they'll start moving toward closeness and union. You say, Randy, every single relationship? No, no. I'm going I'm to deal with that in the last part of the message. There's one more verse I want to share with you, Ephesians 4.29. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. That means I have speech control, God-given speech control. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up, not tearing them down, according to their needs, not my needs, that it may benefit those who listen. What if I were to start asking God to help me with that? God, give me, help, help, me, to, help me to say the right thing at the right time in the right way. It's going to take a while to develop, but wouldn't it likely help to move some relationships this way instead of instead of that way all right let me go on to the second transforming struggles so what about the person randy that no matter what i do so i'm kind and i'm forgiving and i'm compassionate and i'm not insulting and i'm not shouting and you know i'm not having hateful feelings i'm doing all the things god wants me to do i'm watching my speech i'm picking my words i'm trying to say things that'll bless them benefit them build them up but it doesn't matter what i do this this person just they reject me they want nothing to do with me they're angry at me they're bitter at me they want to destroy me um they they just won't forgive me what then are you are you know what am i supposed to do with the person that from all practical standpoints they're an enemy They're, they're like my enemy now by the way the enemies can be those of our own household right it can happen hope it doesn't but it can but a person just takes that posture that i don't care what you do i'm done you're just you're like written out of my life what what about that what do you do then because there's no guarantees that every relationship is going to be healed all right transforming struggles struggles need not be personally detrimental this is the first thing we have to remember we lie to ourselves and we say things like this person's this person's treatment of me this person's rejection it's just destroying me it's killing me it's ruining my life if you let it if you want to lie to yourself doesn't have to doesn't have to he said, well, Randy, Randy what, what am I supposed to do? Let's look on. Love them like an enemy. Remember what Jesus said? He, he said, but to you who are listening, I say, love your You see, God loves. That's just who he is. He says, God is love, God is light, God is spirit. God just proactively loves. It's his way of behaving. He seeks the highest well-being and happiness of all those that he's created. He's just always good to everyone all the time. It doesn't mean everybody receives his goodness. It doesn't mean that everybody benefits from it. If we reject it, we don't benefit from it. But he just proactively, he's proactive. He's not reactive. He proactively loves. Love your enemies. So how do you do that? All right, how, how do you love your enemy? Does that mean you've got to have good feelings toward the enemy? No. It doesn't say have affection for the enemy, thank God. It just says love the enemy. And then he tells us three ways, concrete actions to love an enemy. You may have someone who now is an enemy. But God's calling you to learn to proactively love the enemy. Here's how you do it. First of all, love your enemies. Number one, what do you do? Do do good to those who do what they hate you and you know it look for a way to do good for them that's how you love them number two how do you love the enemy bless those who what curse you they're cursing you they're insulting they're, you, you look for a way to bless on bless them you, you're not going to curse back and then the last way what does it say pray for those who do what mistreat you three ways We can love an enemy. I don't care who the enemy is. We can do these things. God will empower us to do them. Now, here's the thing you need to know. Stop. We must stop lying to ourselves. Oh, it's destroying me. It's killing me. It's ruining my life. It's going to, I'll never be able to breathe again. (laughs) Whatever crazy stuff we say to ourselves. No. 
the enemy actually provides you and I an opportunity to learn how to love the way that God loves. He loves proactively. He loves sacrificially. The enemy allows us to do good when we're not getting any return to bless those who are only cursing us back, to, to pray for those who don't want to see any good come to us. It's a purifying love. It's a love that we're not getting returned, but we can still love in any situation. And you've got to get this point. When you and I love the way that God loves, it does not destroy us. That person can't destroy you or I unless we let them. As long as we determine, I'm going to love them with God's kind of love. They can't destroy us. They will literally develop us. Our love, our capacity to love the way that God loves will grow. It will expand. It will extend. Whereas if we run from the struggle and avoid the pain, we diminish our capacities to love the way that God loves. And we are the losers so even in the worst case scenario, the, the, the worst relational struggle, we can still love. And when we love, we develop. We do not get destroyed, but we have to stop lying to ourselves about it. Now, I just want to say to them, I, I know that probably anyone, every one of us in here have had some relational crashes, some, some blow-ups, some, some failures, whatever term you want to use, some relationships that we cannot put back together. They're never going to be put back together. I don't want you feeling guilty, uncomfortable, condemned, cursed you know we all just need to accept God's forgiveness for those situations and his healing in our lives but going forward going forward we we can do some things differently relationally and that's what the spirit of God is trying to get us to do with this let me go on he says in verse 32 if you love those who love you what credit is that to you even sinners love those who love them so somebody doesn't have to respond to us for us to, to love them the way God does. It goes on and says this finally. You will truly be acting as children of the Most High, for He is kind to those who are unthankful and what? Wicked. You ever think about that? A mafia hitman is going to go out and do a hit. He's going to kill somebody, take their life. But before he goes, he's going to eat a sandwich, and that sandwich tastes good. God gives him that ability to have those taste buds. God blesses even the wicked, the Scripture teaches. He loves proactively. So we can experience what that verse is saying is we can, we can be acting like our Most High, our Creator. We can experience love the way He loves. Rather than being destroyed by the enemy, whoever the enemy may be, we can be developed by the enemy. And sometimes, you've got to listen to this, sometimes... Not all the time. Sometimes. You love the enemy, and the dead relationship is resurrected. Sometimes you love the enemy. It breathes life into the enemy. It takes something that looks dead and hopeless, and it starts to transform it. It doesn't happen all the time. And we don't do it for that reason. If you do it for that reason, then your love is not pure. We love just because it's, it's the way of life. It's the way our God is. It's the only way life works. So, as we leave here today, I'm hoping you're going to leave here thinking that relational struggle is a good thing. It's a normal thing. It doesn't mean your relationship is failing. It doesn't mean you should abandon it. It doesn't mean you should quit. It doesn't mean you should give up. It means, if anything, you're, you're on a path to personal development if you'll stick close to God, receive His constant, dependable love, support, guidance, and then learn to love and learn to live His way. Now, I want to close with a phrase. It says, every good relationship is born of a struggle. In the song that we've used each week to introduce the series, Struggling is the song, or the song is called The Struggler. This is one of the phrases. It says, every good thing is born of a struggle. But we're talking about relationships today. If you believe what you're about to say, what I'd like to do is this. I'll read the white part, and you read the yellow part, and we'll say this loud together. Only if you mean it. Only if you mean it. Here we go. Every good relationship is born of a struggle. So struggle. Struggle and run toward 
relational struggles. Your God is right there with you in the midst. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. He'll, he'll show himself strong in your behalf in ways that until you enter into the deepest, darkest struggle, relational struggle, you won't even think it's possible, but he'll sustain you. He'll uphold you. More importantly, he'll develop you and purify you, and your capacity to love the way he loves will be expanded and extended. You will not be destroyed. You will not be diminished. You will grow, and you'll be beautiful in the process. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you created us in your image for your eternal purposes, and you made us relational beings. How we look forward to when your kingdom comes, your will is done in every heart, every life, every relationship will be perfect forever. Until then, may we be strugglers who depend on you, cling to you, and learn to love the way you love and live the way you live. I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Would you stand to your feet with us? We're going to go have a little bit of fun here in a couple minutes, but before we do, you know, Pastor Randy has you say it. We're going to have you sing this with us. Part of that song goes like this. Go ahead. We'll sing it. Come give us directions. Pray for the food, whatever. I'm praying for the food? Sure. Okay. Well, let me give you some instructions first. Okay, okay. I'll do that. So, okay. hey, if you are here for the first time, <laughs> he's messing me all up, man. I had a flow in my head, and now he's <laughs> changing things. That's all right. He does it to me all the time. If it's your first time, before you head outside and all, we would love the chance to meet you personally. Pastor Randy's going to be over there in Guest Central. Our chance is to say hi, meet you personally. And maybe today you're struggling with so, uh, something serious in life and you need somebody to talk with, somebody to pray with. We invite you over here at Care Central. Guest Central's on that side. So after that, you can pick up your kids, meet us outside, and um, we're going to... You got something more to say? <laughs> and... Uh, You'll just, just go that way. Go to your left, and there's food and fun stuff all over the place. So you can go to the fun stuff, then come back to food. You can grab food first, whatever you want to do. And uh, now, Pastor Pete, you have to pray with food. Go, you, because he was throwing it. Heavenly Father, bless the food in the hands of prepared it. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Go have a blast. It's going to be a great Bye. day. Go on.